In my last part, I talked about the nuclear test site in Emi Fields, featuring the atomic tank. Today's nuclear test site is the largest one in Maralinga for Operation Buffalo. Oh, wait, hold on. Um, are we including Operation Antelope? Just quickly? Okay, Paralinga is located in the Great Victorian Desert in South Australia. This test site was to be the permanent test site for any nuclear testing by the UK government, although they did use the Montebello Islands that one time. They had a list of requirements for the base. Summing it up, they wanted an isolated base that wouldn't cause massive fallout from nearby towns or cities for both safety and security. The main goal for the site was to test any future nukes for as long as they can, so pretty much the Nevada nuclear test site in the USA. They found an optimal location right here. They called it Maralinga, meaning thunder, from an extinct Aboriginal language called Garik, once spoken in the Northern Territory. The site was completed around June 1956. It was staffed by about 200 scientists from Alder Mayston and Harwell, uh, from what I gathered, the UK science universities, uh, 70 other scientists from the UK, 50 Canadian scientists, and 30 Australian scientists. The rest were 500 RAF and RAAF personnel, and also 250 servicemen from the Australian Army. I said in previous parts I'm skipping a lot of the science, politics and maybe now ethics because it is very complicated and I just don't have the time for it. Just know the British were testing bombs in the Great Victoria. Okay, blunt summary, Australian servicemen got radiated slash cancer and the UK scientists knew about it to uh, some degree. Also some aboriginals that were too isolated to be found to get out of the area were basically they accidentally got either cancer. There was one report of one aboriginal that got blind by one nuclear blast. Um, all this stuff came into light at least a decade after the site was closed down and around the time cancer was taken seriously in Australia. So. Operation Buffalo. First bomb was codenamed One Tree. It was a public nuclear test, meaning the media was invited along with a few politicians and other observers. Originally, it was set on the 12th of September, uh, but it was delayed until the 27th due to weather. The bomb was detonated at 5 p.m., yielding around 16 kilotons of TNT. Some observers saw the explosion and were disappointed that the bomb was silent until they heard it a few seconds later. A few minutes later, a Canberra bomber flew into the fallout cloud to collect samples. Wait, hold up. The Canberra bomber was the first jet-powered bomber. It was used as reconnaissance and capable of dropping a tactical nuke. Okay, getting sidetracked, I'll add that plane to the list. Next bomb was codenamed Marku. Detonation was on the 4th of October at 4.30pm, yielding around 1.5 kilotons. Something interesting about this test is that there was a discussion of a joint testing with the USA, but it resulted in only using the American instruments. Also, there was a report that a few politicians were rushed to get to the observation area to witness the explosion. I feel like that's a great setup. I'm just trying to figure out the punchline. The next bomb was codenamed Kite. Detonation was on the 11th of October at 3.27pm, yielding around 3 kilotons. Everything went without a hitch, though they did quite a bit of pre-planning with testing conventional explosions. These explosions were part of the minor trials that were conducted before the nuclear bombs. They had names like Kitten, Rats, Tims, and Vixens. Having different trials for each code name, it's a bit unclear, but about 550 trials between 1953 to 1963 were done. Not all of these were involved with bombs. As said, it was mostly for preparation for the nuclear bombs. They were not considered nuclear bombs, but these were critical and secretive trials that needed to be done. And lastly, codename Breakaway. Detonation was on the 22nd of October at 12.05 a.m., yielding around 10 kilotons. Interesting part is a Douglas DC-4 plane from the Trans-Australian Airlines was diverted to help track the fallout cloud. Okay, okay, sorry for unintentionally teasing my aviator fans. Now comes Operation Antler. Codename Taji, which I hope I said that right, was on the 14th of September 1957, yielding 930 tons, or maybe it was around 1.5 kilotons. Detonation was at 2.30 pm. Weird thing is, it had a strange rumor that the British were developing a cobalt bomb, basically an atomic bomb designed to radiate an area. Well, more radiated than a regular atomic bomb. 
This rumor came due to cobalt pelts being used to help measure the yielding of the bomb. Unfortunately, no one knew about this decision except one scientist. The personnel that were handling the cobalt didn't know it was cobalt-60, a synthetic radioactive isotope of cobalt. Have I failed to mention that servicemen and others got radiated during these operations? Anyway, our uh, next bomb was codenamed Yak. It was detonated on the 21st of September, yielding 6 kilotons. Uh, detonation was at 3.30 a.m. Uh, something happened with the fallout, but I'm unclear about it. And lastly, codenamed Taranaki on the 9th of October. This bomb created the biggest explosion, yielding 26.6 kilotons. So what stopped the testing at Marolinga? Well, some may say public sentiment, since 1957 more and more Australians were opposed to nuclear testing on Australian soil. The 1963 Particle Nuclear Test Ban Treaty played a major part to it. I think it had to do something with moving the test to the Christmas Islands and more cooperation with the USA in nuclear research. Testing in Maralinga ended in 1963, followed by a cleanup operation in 1963 to 1964. Another cleanup was done in 2000. By now it's safe to travel to Maralinga, but I wouldn't go licking the ground as at the time of this script there are nuclear particles within the soil. There are tours to Maralinga, but due to the virus from Dong Country, they have stopped tours at least until the 19th of July. Book now. <laughs> Thank you for watching to the end of the video. Please like and subscribe. It brings a smile to my face. At the time of this script, I'm in lockdown, so for the sake of my mental health, I think I'll be doing an easier history video. So either a straightforward plane video or another Arnett's Biscuit video. Anyways, stay safe everyone. And hope you enjoy yourselves. Yeah, that's it. Bye. Created by Anthony Bezos in Australia.